Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so today we're having a look at learning outcome six as part of VTCT uh, sports massage qualification, the USP 41 unit for anatomy and physiology. So um, we're looking at structure and functions of the nervous system. So this is the only system that I teach that I don't have an acronym for. If you've looked at any of my other videos, there'll be random acronyms flying around everywhere for functions. But for this one, the nervous system, um, even though it's probably the most complex system of the body, in terms of the functions, we can just say it's a, a communication system. So it's sending messages to and from the brain and the spinal cord to different parts of the body, whether it's picking up information or sending the information out to the extremities. So it's receiving stimuli from inside the body and also outside the body. So at the moment, I'm sat here, it's uh, January, it's pretty cold, it's actually minus four outside. Um, so something I'm being stimulated at the moment is I'm pretty cold, um, so my temperature. Um, I'm shivering. I think I've got goosebumps in. Um, normally when I'm teaching, I'm wandering around. If you do know me, I'm pretty active and, and I'm a pacer. Um, so I can feel the cold now. Other things that I'm being stimulated with are the lights. They're quite bright in my clinic here. Um, and also next door's office are quite loud. So on occasions we'll hear voices going on. But all these things are stimuli that I'm being stimulated by that are external. Um, internal stimuli that I'm receiving are feedback from the lunch I've eaten. Um, I may have just gone to the toilet, I may have just had a drink, um, I may be digesting. So all these are internal stimuli. And the nervous system works really closely with the endocrine system. So if you're studying this with me, uh, the endocrine system isn't in the exam. It might be something that you're doing in the workbook. Um, so we won't be learning too much about that, but the endocrine system is all about glands and hormones. And with the nervous system as well, it's trying to balance the body to maintain an internal constant environment known as homeostasis. So homeo is to do with the body and the stasis means to stand still. So it's the body standing still. But what that means is it's trying to keep that balance of everything that's going on. So it doesn't stand still as its name suggests, it's trying to make the not being huge peaks and, and troughs of what's happening with our body. Okay, we don't want a really high temperature followed by a really low temperature. We want this balance of around 36 degrees centigrade. Um, so homeostasis is an important word and that's what the nervous system is trying to maintain. So what's the difference between a nerve and a neuron? Well, a nerve could be an electric cable. I've got one here, actually. Let me, if I pull that out, hopefully it won't affect us too much. There we go. Right, so here's my cable. Now, if I was to strip that cable back or cut it in half, inside that cable, you would see tiny little filaments. So those filaments are the neurons. So inside one nerve, you might have thousands of different neurons inside it. Um, and they're made up of three different sorts. So the neurons are the individual fibres. A nerve is a wrap of many different neurons wrapped up with a connective covering. So an S, a neuron beginning with S. Okay, well done for some of you that shouted at your computer. It is a sensory neuron. Okay, so a sensory neuron is the one that detects the stimuli. So I've already mentioned heat, I've mentioned sound, I've mentioned light. These are all uh, stimuli that are going on at the moment. And they interpret uh, what's happening and they send the messages to the, the brain to say, I'm cold, let's put a coat on. Okay, so that would be the action. So we, we'll always act with the, the responses that we can feel through our sensory neurons. Number two, beginning with an I, isn't a really common one to know, but it... it is a link between the S and the M. So we know S for sensory, the M is motor. So the I is the interneuron, and the interneuron is the link between sensory and motor neurons. And as they're the link between the two, they're found in the brain and the spinal cord, which we can clump together and call the central nervous system. Um, 
not too much to know about that apart from it just uh, passes us the message on through through its journey. But number three is a motor neuron. And a motor neuron is the one, think of motor as movement, motor in a car is the, the bit that gets everything going. So the, the motor neuron will go into a muscle and it will tell that muscle to work. If you've watched the muscular system, uh, you'll see that in a bit more detail, especially with the sliding filament theory. But it also pr produces other kind of movements like gland secretions. So you'll get motor nerves going into sweat glands and sebaceous glands so that they can produce their uh, excretion, the fluid, the mucus, wax, whatever they produce. If you're studying with me, if you get your AMP revision book out, uh, you'll have this diagram. And we're going to just label bits and pieces up. So to start with, you can see at the top here, these little nerve fibres. There's quite a lot of nerve fibres that are coming down uh, towards the cell body. The cell body is the big round thing in the middle. So these are called the dendrites. The dendrites are very small nerve fibres taking impulses towards the cell body. Um, and in the centre of that cell, you've got the nucleus. So that's the brain in the cell which can in interpret what's happening. Uh, the whole thing is the cell, the cell body, and it's surrounded by cytoplasm to keep everything inside. As these many dendrites uh, come towards the cell and it's interpreted, and then it's united and it forms one path out of the cell. And that one fibre that leaves the cell is called the axon. So quite handy, really, because if you've looked at cardiovascular system, any blood vessel leaving the heart, it going away from the heart, beginning with an A, is an artery. And similar, uh, a nerve fibre leaving or going away from the cell body is also begins with an A, it's an axon. So the nerve fibre that goes, the blue thing that goes right through the middle of this is the axon. But the green covering is um, it's a fatty coat called the myelin sheath. Okay, but it's it's separated into these little blocks. So the blocks are called Schwann cells. The nerve fiber underneath it that's wrapped in this fatty coat is the axon, and the green substance that you can see there, the the whole covering of it is called the myelin sheath. Now, as uh, the nerve uh, the impulses come towards the cell body and it's gone through this one axon it will then split up again and it can go into many different nerve uh, sorry, muscle fibers or uh, glands to tell them to secrete or to produce movement so they're called the axon terminals so the myelin sheath is there uh, to protect just think of it as a big fatty coat so if you were to wear a, a big coat made of fat for whatever reason, I'd probably quite appreciate one in here because it is, I think it's only 10 degrees, my working environment. Um, if I was to put that on, I could probably run into the walls quite quickly and, uh, and be protected from knocks and bumps. So protection is one reason for a fatty coat. Uh, another reason would be to keep you warm or insulated. And when things are warm, they tend to work better. So you find the movement a lot quicker. And a myelin sheath can increase nerve impulse up to 200 times the speed of it would be if it didn't have the, the coat on. Characteristics of a new one. So I have, let me just click on there. Excuse me. Not right. okay. uh, so we've talked about dendrites. And we've talked about the axon already. So we've talked about the little fibres and we've talked about the uh, single axon that will come out. Other things we I've also mentioned uh, verbally are the myelin sheath. So I said it was a fatty insulating layer that covers an axon and it speeds up nerve impulses up to 200 times. And then the axon terminals at the end. Um, they will pass messages on to either the glands or the nerves. So in this diagram at the bottom, you may have seen this before. Okay. Um, these are the axons going to the axon terminals and these are uh, skeletal muscle fibres. So each one of those muscle fibres is being stimulated by this nerve um, via a chemical messenger, a neurotransmitter. So I'll give you a bonus point if you can... Remember, if you have looked at this before, 
a neurotransmitter that will tell the muscle fibres to contract. I'm just writing it down here so you've got the spelling. So if you've said this word, acetylcholine, okay, that is the neurotransmitter that will tell the muscle fibres to contract. Structure of a nerve. Uh, I mentioned this uh, again as well as about uh, the electricity cable. So this diagram here, it goes under a microscope. They're all the tiny little new ones that are packed into one membrane called the neurolemma. Um, and a nerve can be a selection of different new ones. So it can be a mixture of sensory and motor nerves, all packed within one nerve cable, let's say, or one nerve fibre. Okay, moving on to the brain. Uh, by CNS, we mean central nervous system. So again, if you've got this diagram, please start to label it up. The big blue structure in the middle is called the cerebrum. So the cerebrum makes up 80% of the brain. And most of the body functions that you can think of that you would need a brain for, thinking and knowledge and memory, um, would come from the cerebrum. Also visualisation and, and interpreting sounds and things. So really important part and makes up 80%. Um, then we've got the pons, so the orange structure there, or pons veroli. And the pons is um, to do with sending messages to and from the spinal cord, but also to regulate breathing. Underneath the pons, you've got the medulla oblongata. You might recognise the word medulla as being middle, in the middle of something. But medulla oblongata is one of the most vital parts of the brain in terms of regulating breathing and heart rate and reflexes. Underneath the medulla oblongata, the purple structure there, is the spinal cord. So the spinal cord is going to go down through the, the hole in the skull at the back here. It goes all the way down through the, um, the foramen in the uh, vertebra. And any idea where the spinal cord stops? At what level of vertebra does the spinal cord stop. Okay, it actually goes down to about L2, lumbar 2, um, and then it forms something called the corda equina, which translates as horse's tail. So where the spinal cord stops at L2, you've still got some spine left, still got some vertebrae, and it will make this little horse's tail at the bottom and the ner nerves will split up um, and they go around the, the pelvic floor, that area. What else have we got? We've got the cerebellum. Now this purple structure that's at the back of the skull is the cerebellum and that's to do with balance, posture, coordination, muscle tone. Um, so it's all kind of movement based, uh, I would say subconscious as well, um, involuntary control of muscles. And the midbrain, the midbrain in the centre um, is passing passing messages on, but it's also for um, auditory responses and visual. Okay, so here we've got three real brains. You probably recognise the big one as being a, a human brain, but try and work out what you think the other two brains might be, what animals they might be. And also, if you have a look at the proportions, so with this human brain, the cerebellum is about 20% or a fifth of the whole brain. You can see you could fit four of those in there. So that would be a fifth. And have a look at this one. And have a look at this tiny little one on the end. What percentage or what fraction is the cerebellum of the whole brain? It's kind of about a third, isn't it? So in terms of the functions of brain, if the cerebellum is to do with balance, posture, muscle tone, proprioception, and the big part of the brain, the cerebrum, is to do with memory, thoughts, etc. What animal do you think is really good at balance, but not very good at thinking? Hmm, good question. Cat. <laughs> Sorry for those cat owners out there. Um, cats are really good at balancing. You can, they can walk on fence posts, they can walk on roofs of houses. Uh, apparently they've got nine lives. 
I'm not sure how correct that is, but uh, what it means is they, you know, have got the ability to do really cool stuff and fall off and not really hurt themselves. But do are they good at learning? Are they good at languages? Are they good at emotions? Mm, not sure. Cat lovers will say it differently to me. And uh, the monkey, monkey in the middle there, and then the human brain. Okay, functions of the CNS. Uh, I've gone through this verbally, but if you want this to make notes on. So the cerebrum, the cerebrum is for conscious control, anything that we can think about uh, doing as voluntary actions. Um, emotions, memory, voluntary actions, learning. Um, there's a lot of visual and auditory responses in there as well. Uh, the cerebellum is the the little one at the back. It's 20% of the brain. Um, I've mentioned this a few times. So posture, coordination, balance, etc. Um, if you're in your exam and you can't remember the difference, think of a cat having a big cerebellum and think of uh, uh, cat's good functions. Uh, spinal cord. Spinal cord um, is just there to relay messages to and from parts of the body up to the brain. Uh, and I mentioned it stops at L2. Okay, so the brainstem. The brainstem, there are three different parts to the brainstem. We've uh, written it down on our diagram already. Um, but just to tell you, because the, one year there was a, an exam question that asked, what are the three main structures of the brainstem? And the first one is the midbrain. So the midbrain is there for visual and auditory reflexes or responses. The pons, to do regulating breathing, and the medulla oblongata. Most vital part of the brain, heart rate, breathing, and reflexes. So those three parts are components of the brain stem, which then unites and carries on into the spinal cord. Okay. Clever chimps. All right, clever chimps. So I watched this programme a while ago and it was about uh, these chimpanzees that lived in Tokyo and uh, they had a really cool park. They had uh, everything they needed inside this area for them. Um, but when they got hungry, they were taught to crawl through this tube and dropped into the science lab. Now, I don't know if this picture is of the exact science lab because it doesn't look very technical to me, but uh, from a monkey, I, I presume it is. Um, so when this monkey got hungry, he actually started to identify, learn that when he did something on the computer screen, he would get a reward of a banana. And uh, we, we all know how motivating food is. You know, I, I would do most things for a Mars bar. Um, OK, so what he had to do was he had to recognise numbers and it was a touchscreen computer. And he learned what one looked like. And if you press one, he got a banana. And it was over a series of time that he could recognise numbers. But it got to such a point where you've got this grid at the top here. So it was a three by three grid. And the numbers would flash on and flash off. And when they were off, he had to point to where the numbers were, but in order. So from going from one to nine. And if he did that correctly, he would get his food prize. And he did that so well that then they asked for the uh, World Memory Guy to come and challenge him. Now, this memory guy can remember 52 packs of playing cards, of which there are 52 cards in each pack, um, in order. Now, that is absolutely incredible. But they competed, or they had a competition for the memory man and the chimpanzee and in this experiment. And 80% of the time, the chimpanzee won. So, I want you to draw this. So quickly sketch a three by three grid. I'm then going to flash up nine numbers and they'll be on screen for less than a second. OK, so keep watching. Well, I'll let you draw it first or pause me. And I'm going to flash these numbers up. I'm going to say three, two, one, flash them up and then flash them off. OK, and then when they're off, I want you to draw and write them down on your screen. OK, ready? Three, two, one. One. Okay. So now you're going to write them down in your grid. If you missed it, you're going to rewind me and you're going to cheat. But that's okay because I don't know about that. 
uh, my the idea of doing this is you know that that's what the chimpanzee was doing and he was then able to without even drawing them on point to where these numbers were okay so if if you couldn't think or if you weren't sure that's that is the answer okay so central nervous system is all about the brain and the spinal cord um, we're going to move on to PNS peripheral nervous system so the word periphery means outside external the outer areas which is exactly what this is in the nervous system so it's all of the nerves going or leading up to the brain and spinal cord everything not included in the brain and the spinal cord so what does it include it includes all the sensory and motor nerves and these include themselves so um, from the brain you've got 12 pairs of cranial cranial nerves that extend around the head and they will go to the eyes the nose the mouth the ears the face so there's facial nerves there's optic nerve um, there's an oculomotor nerve okay so that they're stimulating or connecting to all, all of your facial organs and muscles and then so they're part of the PNS the brain itself is part of the CNS uh, another part of the PNF is the spinal nerves and this diagram down the end here where are we down here so the thick thing in the, in the middle is the spinal cord but all the little strands that come off it and all the ones that go down the arms and the legs they're spinal nerves and there's 31 pairs of spinal nerves what else is included in the, the PNS so the somatic nervous system is the part of the nervous system that goes to the skeletal muscles and that are the use the voluntary movements so us thinking about doing these movements and opposed to the voluntary movements you've got the ans the autonomic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system is all that automatic response to things such as um uh, your breathing and your heart rate, your internal organs, your pupils dilating, your hair standing up on end, all those things that you don't physically, or you can't think about to produce an action. They, they happen, fortunately, um, automatically. Okay, and it all happens for a reason, and the reason is to maintain homeostasis, to balance the body. Um, it comes up in the exam quite a bit about receptors and naming receptors so we're going to name a few of these so there's a receptor in the body that detects blood pressure if you know of a device that detects air pressure if you know the name of that uh, this is going to help you and most of the receptors end in the word receptor so uh, a device that measures air pressure is called a barometer and in the body the receptor that detects blood pressure is a baroreceptor, okay, from the word barometer, or baro meaning pressure. What do you think a receptor in the body is called that detects chemicals? Okay, not as hard as it appears, it's a chemoreceptor. What about a receptor that detects mechanical stimuli? and mechanoreceptor pain hmm. pain and damaging stimuli this is a one I, I hadn't heard of but I hadn't heard of the prefix the prefix sorry so um, I went and researched it and it's from the Latin no sir meaning to hurt so a receptor in the body that detects pain if you stand on a drawing pin or a Lego or a plug or anything like that which is pretty painful um, it would be your nosy scepter that's been stimulated what about motion and body position the body is really cool because if i shut my eyes or had something over my eyes and i did that with my hands i don't have to look at where my hand is i know exactly where it is by feel okay i can put certain fingers up in the air and i know by feel exactly what i'm doing i don't have to be able to look at these actions so the receptors in the body that allow us to do that are called proprioceptors proprioception knowing where body parts are without having to look and then easy one at the end there um heat and cold so what kind of detector what receptor would detect temperature 
that's a thermoreceptor. So for the uh, multiple choice exam, it might ask, for example, which of the following detects blood pressure and it would give you a list of proprioceptors, nociceptors, etc. So pl please uh, have a look at that and uh, learn those. So major nerves of the body. Most nerves of the body that are bigger than the width of the pencil lead have a name. And most of the names are named after the bones that they lie next to. So just by seeing this diagram here, I um, probably can't make out individual ones. But in anatomical position, if you're standing there with your palms forward, what is the bone called that um, is on the thumb side? What bone's on the thumb side? And the thumb side would be on the outer section. So that's your radius. So there's a nerve that runs down there called the radial nerve. And then finger side. What bone's on finger side? Little finger side, it's the ulna. So there's an ulna nerve. But there's also a nerve that lies in between the two, and that's not named after a bone. That's called the median nerve. So some nerves are named after bones and others are not. <laughs> so they're the ones that take, take a bit more learning. I've put some up here, so we've mentioned those two. Median nerve, I've said, lies in between the two, and it's the median nerve that's affected with carpal tunnel syndrome. The median nerve, the, um, the nerve uh, distribution for the median nerve, so people with carpal tunnel will feel sensation or poor sensation in their thumb, finger, index finger, middle finger, and then the inside edge of this finger. It's very specific. Whereas ulnar nerve is little finger and this part, and radial nerve is more on this surface here. So me no median nerve is in between the two, radial and ulnar. A femoral nerve is uh, down the femur, it's the front surface of the thigh. Sciatic, so we don't have a sciatic bone, but uh, if anyone has unfortunately suffered with sciatic, you'll know exactly where this nerve pathway goes. I've had sciatica on uh, a few occasions and I might not feel it in my lower back, but it could start there. I definitely feel it in my glutes, okay, my buttocks. Um, it goes through there, it goes down the back of the leg, so maybe down through the hamstring, into the calf. If it's really bad, you'll actually feel it going into the big toe. So that would be the nerve distribution of the sciatic nerve. Uh, the peroneal nerve, remember where the peroneal muscles are. I call the peroneal muscles Adidas strike mu muscles. So if you were to wear Adidas, there's a, a link for YouTube. <laughs> the peroneal muscles are outside of lower leg where your stripes would be. So the peroneal nerve sits there. The tibial nerve is down the, the big chunky bone, so it's more inner. Um, brachial, you haven't got a bone called brachial, but you should start to know now all different body parts. So the, the brachial part of the body is the upper arm. So you've got the bicep brachii, the tricep brachii, the brachialis muscle. Okay, so the brachial refers to this upper arm. Reflex arc. Just a little bit on this. Reflex arcs. Why do reflex arcs or actions work? Why, why are they invented? Why do we have them? Um, in class, I would get you all to uh, sit on a couch or on a, a high stool either cross your legs or dangle your leg off nice and freely and then tap just underneath so you've got your hard patella then you've got a squashy bit just under the patella before it attaches to the tibia it's that squashy bit which is the patella tendon that you would tap stroke hit <laughs> um so I, I do it with the side of my hand which can be quite effective or you can actually have a proper patella hammer but why does the leg kick or why should the leg kick when you tap this tendon what is the reason behind it? Okay, so if you want to have a little go practically, um, that's the common one that, that people know of, but there are lots of reflexes and reflex actions uh, related to different muscles and nerves in the body. So there's one on the bicep, end of the bicep tendon, which makes your bicep contract. There's a, a brachioradialis one that, that will do that with your hand. There's one on the tricep, there's one on the back of the Achilles. Uh, so what's happening with the reflex arc? If you can imagine the patella tendon being an elastic band, okay, so we've got an elastic band that goes from the patella to the tibia. And if you hit that elastic band, what's happening to the band? Okay, it will be stretching, won't it? So inside the patella tendon, 
you've got these Golgi tendon um, apparatus and they detect the stretch. So as you hit it, it will stretch and these ten these um these Golgi tendon organs will detect it. Um, because they're detecting a stretch, it's an automatic reaction. A reflex action doesn't waste time going up to the brain if it doesn't need to. Because for that to go from the knee to the spinal cord, all the way up the spinal cord to the brain, for the brain to then say what's happening, to send the message back, actually takes too long. So it will go to the nearest bit of central nervous system. So as you tap that patella tendon, the body thinks it's been damaged because suddenly this tendon has been stretched. It will send a message. Ooh, let's go this way. It will send a message. So you've got the stretch going on here, which sends a message down through this sensory neuron into this is um, spinal cord. So it goes in through the spinal cord. Now it's got two pathways. Without getting too complex, let's let's just go this way and say the sensory neuron then goes to the interneuron, which we said lies in the central nervous system and connects the two. And then it goes through the motor neuron. Okay, there's two pathways for that. Let's carry on this one. So if the motor neuron goes into the quadricep muscle and when the quadriceps contract, what's going to happen with the knee or the lower leg? When the quads contract, the knee's going to kick. Okay, what this one is doing is it inhibits it. It stops the hamstrings from working to allow that kicking action. So reflex actions are there as a protective mechanism to stop damage, stop injury. Okay, but they're also there for um, level five therapists, osteopath, physios, doctors to be able to identify nerve damage. Okay, so depending on where you tap and you get these actions, it can tell you if there are problems with different levels of the spinal cord. Functions of the ANS. So we've said ANS is autonomic. It controls involuntary movements of internal organs, so stomach, bladder, liver, ladies' uterus, blood vessels and glands, and uh, will also control smooth and cardiac muscle tissue. So all the autonomic responses, automatic responses. And there are, are two different divisions to the ANS. The first division is the sympathetic nervous system. I use a buzzword. I've got lots of different ways to remember things because um, I've got lots of things to remember. Um, and my buzzword for the sympathetic nervous system is stress. So think when you're stressed or the, the term fight or flight, say you're walking down the road and um, you've got a bag with you and in your bag you've got your house keys, you've got a passport, you've got your phone, you've got a wallet and someone tries to grab it off you. You know, instant reaction could be one of two things. One would be to run away and hopefully save yourself from being injured at all. Um, or the second one could be to try and fight, fight this person and fight and get your bag back because it's got everything that's uh, important to you in there. doesn't matter what you decide to do, whether you're running away or you're trying to get your bag back, the, your body's going to react in exactly the same way. So firstly, working with the endocrine system, it's going to produce adrenaline and you're going to feel that big rush of, oh no, what's happening? I need to do something. And it puts you into kind of automatic, automatic drive. The other thing it's going to do is stimulate your sympathetic nervous system. So your heart rate's going to go up. Your breathing's going to get quicker. Your mouth might feel dry. Okay, there's all these different reactions. So if this was an exam question and you see the word sympathetic nervous system, Think of stress. Think of a stressful situation. And the stressful situation might be being sat in an exam, being asked a question on the sympathetic nervous system. <sighs> Hammers go a bit clammy. <sighs> You're a bit sweaty. Those kind of things. Um, the opposite one, as things uh, these work in pairs, parasympathetic nervous system is going to do the opposite effect. So my buzzword for this is paradise. So lying on a beach, chilling out, listening to the waves, oh, smelling that beach barbecue. Mm, someone's bringing a cocktail. Okay, this is nice. This is nice. I'm enjoying this. So what's happening? My heart rate's lower. I'm not sweating too much. I'm not thinking about the temperature. I'm not, not sweating too much. But that beach barbecue, oh, let's get my, let's get my salivary glands activated. 
Mm. Oh, I can start to feel my gastric juices now. My stomach start rumbling. So these are the kind of effects you would get from the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, it's turned for rest and digest. So when you're resting, everything's generally lowered. Um, however, you're more likely to digest food and your internal, your um, intestines, di uh, the digestion organs are going to be more active. So ev everyday bodily actions are going to be stimulated. However, your heart rate and your breathing, etc., are going to slow down. Um, that leads us on to this diagram, uh, which we can just have a, a quick check just to make sure I won't go through it all. But a sympathetic, your buzzword stress. So how does stress affect these different organs? How does stress affect your heart rate? increase you might want to draw a little arrow increases how does it affect your breathing how does stress affect your intestines okay um th they wouldn't work too well you know if you're if you're in a horrible situation that i described earlier you're not going to think about oh let's digest that bit of cake i had uh, half an hour ago okay your your whole game is to your whole sense of urgency is your increased uh, breathing and heart rate to uh, try and work out this situation. Okay, so don't worry too much about digestion or going to the toilets at this point in your sympathetic nervous system. What about your pupils? What do you think is going to happen with your pupils? Are they going to dilate or constrict? In a stressful situation, pupils normally dilate, so they widen, and you can pick up a lot of information. Um, if you're at a criminal scene or if you're first on the scene to an accident or something, you will pick up a lot more information than you think um, when, when you ask questions about it. You'll start to remember things. Okay, so you've got more, more vision, more ability to pick things up. Your mouth, though, is going to feel really dry. So when you're stressed, it's dry. And it's also related to not wanting to digest as well. Um, this one is a bit different. There's your kidney, and on top of your kidney, you've got an adrenal gland. So that adrenal gland is now producing adrenaline. So with everything else that's going on, you're going to feel that urge. You're going to feel the uh, adrenaline rush into your body. There was um, a real story, actually, about uh, an old lady in a house fire. And um, she needed to leave the building as quickly as possible. And she was, I think she was in her 70s, um, but the whole situation filled her with adrenaline so much so that her only thought was to rescue her grand piano which was inside the building that had been passed down through generations and the when the fire brigade arrived they found this old lady moving the grand piano out of the house and then it took four firemen to lift it up for her and she'd done it on her own so there, there are some incredible stories about uh, how adrenaline affects the body uh, on this side Paradise, parasympathetic, so pupils will constrict, will be more, more saliva gland action, getting you ready to digest food. These two are going to decrease, so breathing and heart rate. Stomach and intestines and bladder are going to work a bit better because uh, when you're resting, you're more likely to get, be going to the toilet and need, need to empty your bladder. And just finally then, the last slide, you may have this in your revision book. Uh, it's just to put everything together. And uh, just to, as a quick recap, so we said the nervous system can be divided into two sections, uh, the central nervous system, the CNS, and the PNS, which is going to go here, but uh, my, we're working down this side first. Uh, so the central nervous system, what makes up the CNS? You've got the brain and you've got the spinal cord. So the brain... Um, again, as a bit of a revision for you after this, you can write anything you want to underneath it, annotates it a bit more. So what are the different parts of the brain? You've got the cerebellum, the cerebrum, the brain stem. You can jot these bits down and say, do I know what the function of each are as well? Just to revise. The spinal cord is just to relay messages back and forth to the brain um, and extremities. And it ends at L2. So that's your CNS. And then going over to the PNS, the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system, um, divided into two sections, 
motor nerves and sensory nerves or neurons, which we did uh, about 35 minutes ago. So let's see if you can remember about those. So the motor neurons will go to the muscles and the glands and the sensory neurons will do all the detecting the, the senses, the light, sound, etc. Motor neurons, uh, so to do with the movement, moving the body, um, it can be divided into the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic nervous system is related to voluntary action of your skeletal muscles and the autonomic oops, is the automatic response of things. And the last slide we've just done is your answer to this one. So you've got... Uh, Fight and flight and rest and digest. So one begins with an S, the stress, and one begins with a P, the paradise. And these are words you need to be able to come up and uh, be able to remember. Sympathetic is your stress part, and your parasympathetic is your paradise, your resting, where everything generally slows down apart from your everyday bodily activities. So that's the nervous system. Uh, done in 40 minutes not too bad as it is uh, a complex system but uh, what I'm doing here is I'm teaching it for you for this module of the course okay if you're more interested in nervous system you can get a lot more theory elsewhere or if you want to do a uh, neurospinal assessment course then uh, I've got one of those coming up as well so have a look on my website all right I'll thank you and I'll see you on the next system